Well, welcome everyone this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Van Gessel. I'm the Extension Weed Specialist for the University of Delaware. And I'm located down at the uh, Research and Education Center in Georgetown. And the topic I was asked to uh, talk about this morning is herbicide mode of action or mechanism of action and how that relates primarily to, to symptoms that we see in the field. If anyone came in here to hear a heavy biochemistry and plant physiology talk, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's not my forte. What I want to do is kind of talk about uh, herbicide mode of action and how that relates to what we see in the field in terms of, of diagnosing injury. Before I get, uh, do that, though, I want to get into some, uh, some of the terms that uh, be used throughout the rest of the talk, just make sure we're all on the same page. First one is a herbicide active ingredient. That is the, 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 the term that we use for the chemical that's actually providing the weed control itself. It's the one responsible for controlling weeds. The chemistry is a more, um, uh, herbicide chemistry is something that we often use to help classify products and kind of lump them together. You know, so they're not talking about each individual active ingredient, but how can we group them together to get better understanding of what, what we're talking about. We're all familiar with pesticide labels and what's on the pesticide labels, but uh, as we talk about this, the chemical name, the active ingredient, this is that long name that none of us can pronounce. We have the common name, um, which for a lot of us is still challenging to pronounce, but the chemical name and the common name are listed on the labels. They stay regardless of what the trade names might, might uh, be. You know, as, as a lot of companies are, uh, uh, products are coming off patent, we have a lot of uh, generics out there. These trade names and product names change from company to company, but it's the common name and the chemical name that remains consistent across products. So um, um, those are the ones that we look for, look for to try to, com if we're trying to compare one product to another uh, when things start to go off patent. The term mode of action, we hear that term a lot. Um, the, technically the term mode of action are all the processes that are affected by that herbicide, or the entire sequence of events that it takes to kill that plant or injure that plant. Whereas the mechanism of action, sometimes referred to as the site of action, is the specific biochemical site or process that, that occurs. So the mechanism of action is very specific and that usually leads to a chain of events that we refer to as mode of action. The other, uh, as we start to look and, and group herbicides together, one of the things that we often look at is this this number, the uh, group number of herbicides that most companies are now putting on their labels. This is a voluntary process through the EPA to help understand the, the similarities between products. And they're li listing this based on the mechanism um, of the group of herbicides or the mechanism of, of, of action. I'm nervous about hitting these buttons up here because they all look the same. If you hit the wrong one, you go to the bottom of the, uh, the presentation. I'm trying to avoid that. So looking at like classifying herbicides um, and, and uh, how, how are we classifying them from a hierarchical standpoint. Um, we start at the top is the mode of action. Again, that's the entire sequence of events that it takes to either cause the injury or to, or to kill the plant. We have the mechanism of action. That's the specific biochemical reaction that happens. There might be multiple um, herbicide families that have that same mechanism of action. And then within the herbicide family, we have the individual products. So here's an example of uh, um, looking at uh, lipid synthesis inhibitors. Uh, we often refer to those as ACCase inhibitors because what they do is they inhibit the ACCase uh, um, pro, um, molecule and cause the, the, the lipid synthesis. There's uh, three different chemical families that are in there, uh, often referred to as the DIMs, the FOPs, and now the DENs. So Cethoxidim, uh, uh, Clethodim are all within the, the DIMs, the FOPs, the Fluazifop or, or Fusilade, 
And now the new product that's uh, relatively new, been on the market for, for a few years, is the Axial, which is a DIN. Um, the reality is, uh, from, from a practical standpoint, all these products are very similar. They all have the same mechanism of action. When we start to think about uh, um, symptoms and uh, tr tr trying to identify which product might have been involved, they're all going to have very similar symptoms um, in the field. Another example of, of hierarchy is uh, our, our mode of action, uh, photosynthetic, photosynthetic inhibitor stops photosynthesis. There's two, there's, in this particular example, there's two different mechanisms of, of action or biochemical reactions that stop photosynthesis. Um, we're talking about the group five herbicides, which includes the triazines and the triazona. Um, so the, the triazine is like atrazine the triazonone is uh, Sencor. They're both group fives, but they separate out because of the, the herbicide family or the chemical structures of the plant, uh, of, the, of the molecules. Um, the other example, uh, the other example of a mechanism of action is group seven, which is a substituted urea, and uh, the, the, the specific herbicide in this case is diuron. So, Here's an example of a of mode of action. The end result is stopping photosynthesis, but there's two different ways of getting at that stopping photosynthesis. There's with those within the group five and the group sevens, and those represent three different uh, herbicides in this particular example. A couple of other terms uh, that uh, to, to consider as we go through this, the application method or application site whether we're talking about products that are applied to the soil, soil applied, or foliar applied. Um, we also think about things in terms of when they're applied. Are they applied early plant, um, early pre-plant, excuse me, pre-plant incorporated, applied to the soil surface and mechanically incorporated, pre-emergence, post-emergence. These planting times, pre-plant, um, uh, pre-emergence, post-emergence, are usually given in terms of relation to when the crop is planted. It gets, um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Herbicides that are applied, um, um, what happens to them once they, uh, uh, um, the foliar applied herbicides, they enter the plants through the leaf surface or through the stomates and get into the plant. Um, some may translocate, meaning they'll move throughout the plant. Others do not translocate, they remain um, their, their site of action or where they have their, their impact is right at the point of contact between them, that herbicide droplet and the leaf surface. We refer to those as contact herbicides. Some herbicides are going to have both uh, uh, foliar and root absorption. Translocation, meaning again, plants are, uh, the, the, the herbicide is moving throughout the plant. It usually moves to the point of most active uh, uh, activity um, within the plant. When we think of products that are translocated, we often think that uh, knowing that they're translocated, coverage is not as important of an issue as it is with something that uh, is contact. Uh, translocated herbicides examples are, are lipid synthesis inhibitors or ACCase inhibitors, the amino acids uh, like uh, glyphosate, uh, plant growth regulators. Um, all translocate throughout the plant. On the other side of that, we have our contact herbicides. They, um, this is only the plant parts that come in contact with the herbicide are affected. These are the ones that would require much better coverage, um, complete coverage of the plant in order for optimum control. Most of these contact herbicides are relatively fast acting. Within um, days, we start to see activity. Um, some of the examples of that are the uh, nitrogen metabolism inhibitors like glyphosate or cell membrane disruptors like Paraquat. As I mentioned, with contact herbicides, coverage is important for, for control. Um, not only covering and, and activity on the leaves, but making sure that the, the meristems of the stems are also killed. Here in this example here in this diagram, you got a, a plant here. Our, our leaf, but there's, there's often meristematic or um, tissue in the axils of the leaf where that petiole attaches to the stem. That will give rise to new leaves, new stems, other tissue. If we don't effectively kill those uh, uh, buds, 
they'll often regrow if in, in many situations. So with a contact herbicide, we're trying to cover not only the leaves, but also the destroying these, these, these uh, meristematic tissues, uh, the axillary buds. The larger the plant becomes, the more difficult that is. As I mentioned, some products will have activity both um, on the leaves as well as on the roots. Things like triazine, um, where it can be taken up through the leaf, um, also the roots. But in order for, for it to have both activity on the same plant, those roots need to be fairly close to the soil surface um, to have both root and uh, leaf uptake. Specific symptoms that we see with mode of action. Um, you know, products that are within the same family are very difficult to separate out. Uh, we tend to think of this in, in uh, more general terms. You know, trying to identify whether uh, Banville versus 2,4-D was applied or whether uh, Matrix or Nicosulfuron or Accent were applied. Difficult to do until you start to separate out on, on individual species um, activity but there are some general characteristics of these uh, uh, symptoms based on their mechanism and, and modes of action that we can at least start to narrow down what is the culprit. These type of symptoms we see are whether it's, it's a direct application intended to kill the, uh, the weeds as herbicidal activity, or in the cases of misapplication or sprayer contamination where a crop is injured, um, the symptoms are gonna be similar across the whole spectrum of, of species. Another thing that's helpful to identify what type of uh, uh, product is involved in, in either causing the injury or killing the weed is the speed at which it occurs. Some are very rapid, some are much slower. Kind of think of herbicides as in 10 major classes. Um, we have the uh, seedling group inhibitors, photosynthetic inhibitors, pigment inhibitors or bleachers, plant growth regulators, protein synthesis inhibitors, fatty acid inhibitors, cell membrane disruptors, and nitrogen metabolism disruptors. So kind of the, the 10 major classes, they all seem, they all often have very distinctive uh, uh, symptoms to identify them. But again, looking at individual products within those major classes can be very challenging to do. So kind of going, working through that list of what the different products are, their mechanism, um, of action and, the and, and ultimately the, the symptoms that we see. So with seedling growth inhibitors, an example of that is uh, Prow or Treflan. Um, they, they inhibit both root and shoot of the seedlings. They, uh, they're, they're soil applied. They need to be taken up by the roots of the shoots as it moves through that treated zone. They have, um, uh, most products within this class have little if any foliar activity. Um, they inhibit mitosis or inhibit cell wall division. As a result, since cell wall division doesn't occur, it, you end up with uh, um, fat, clubby roots, uh, swollen stems as a result of that. Here's some of the examples, the uh, dinitroanalids, the uh, sonolan, um, kermit, treflan, dactol falls in within this group. Here's some of the symptoms that we often associate with seedling growth inhibitors. Um, uh, swollen roots, poorly, uh, no root hairs on some of these roots, on uh, seedling stems or, or hypocotyls as they come through, they get very often, mouse, there we go. Mouse doesn't show up on here. Okay, here we go. So you, you tend to get very thickened uh, uh, um, hypocotyls and lower stems, very poor root development. We've got a few videos to, to, to illustrate some of these points. The, you probably didn't see these on any award shows, but they do give an example, and they are pretty slick, uh, interesting to watch on their activity. So here on the left is untreated soil as these oats start to germinate and move through the soil. The soil on the right is treated with treflan. See the roots move right up to that treated zone, and they don't penetrate any further. That, uh, um, that, that trap line in the soil stopping root development. Looking at some of the pictures of, of the swollen roots of that. Similar uh, 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 within the seedling inhibitors are the long chain fatty acids. This is a very broad group of, of herbicides. It includes lasso, dual, 
um, Zidua um, harness all fall within that group. These are again applied to the soil before the weeds emerge. Uh, before the weeds um, um, uh, emerge, the herbicide is taken up through the shoots. That's why we call them shoot inhibitors. They inhibit cell growth and cell divisions. The exact mechanism of action is not very well understood within this group. But because of having impact and effect on cell growth and development, you end up with stunted plants, often very poor growth um, root development. You often um, may get plants that will start to unfurl, particularly grasses that may start to unfurl mm -hmm. under the soil and the leaves don't uh, completely uh, separate from one another. The, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, the long chain flat fatty acid, sometimes referred to as the chlorosetamides. Um, here's the examples, the harness, lasso, dual, and, and zidua. Here's some of the, the, the symptoms. Um, here's some oats that were sprayed with, with dual. The untreated side, the oats came up just fine. On the treated side, you see they, they've just start to poke up, but they really don't uh, develop much beyond that uh, spike stage. Um, you get some poor root development, like down here in the um, bottom right-hand corner. Um, upper right-hand corner, um, a lot of times if the plant emerges, maybe get a slug of rain to move that herbicide down into the, the shoots and it starts to get taken up. You might get uh, poor unfurling of, of a corn or a grass plant. The third group, the photosynthetic inhibitors, um, uh, the, the, the classic example of, uh, within this group is atrazine. These are generally soil applied, but they can also um, have foliar activity. This is one of those groups that goes both uh, pre and, and or soil and foliar activity. Um, they stop photosynthesis, they inhibit photosynthesis, uh, and uh, they, as, as a result of stopping photosynthesis, sugars aren't produced, uh, carbohydrates aren't produced, and the plant starts to uh, um, starve. These can be fairly uh, slow acting, um, particularly as soil um, treatments. Because they stop photosynthesis, uh, when you think of atrazine that might be applied to the soil, a lot of times you'll see the plants emerge, but then they stop at that point. They're, they emerge because they're coming off the, the carbohydrates reserved in those cotyledons in, um, from the seed. Once that, that that's, uh, reserve is used up, they start taking up soil solution, picking up that herbicide, and then they stop growing at that point. Some of the examples of within photosynthetic inhibitors have the S-triazines like uh, Princep, uh, the um, triazinones, the um, metribuzin, um, Synbar falls in within this class as well. Um, some of the photosynth photosynthetic inhibitors that are non-mobile, that don't move throughout the plant, Bucktril and Bassagran fall within that um, group. Some of the symptoms that we often see, um, this is with uh, triazines or atrazine. Um, we're seeing injury on the margin of the leaf. You see this on this morning glory, we start to see some browning on the margins of the leaf. It often shows up first on the oldest leaves. This is an application of atrazine that was made to the soil and it's being picked up by the plant. Uh, why do you think we're starting to see the symptoms more on the margin of the leaf as opposed to the interior part of the leaf of this plant? This was atrazine applied to the soil. Yes? The most actively growing part? The most act it's, you're close, so you're on the right track, the most actively growing. It's also the point where, we're, where it has the highest water demand. So the water's moving up throughout the plant and we get most evaporation on the margins of the leaf, so the more atrazine is concentrating on that margin of the leaf and why we're starting to see it. Um, on the older leaves, we're seeing it certainly because they are more active um, um, in terms of photosynthesis, and that's why we're seeing it, whereas the younger leaves, the older leaves are sending their sugars to those younger leaves. That's why we're seeing it on the older leaves first, because that's where photosynthesis is most active. Here's some atrazine on, on oats. 
They were treated in uh, uh, treated soil. They're planted in treated soil. So they're coming up. They're looking just fine. And about day seven or eight is when they start to turn backwards. So they're starting off fine because they were coming off that uh, carbohydrates reserved in the seed. And it's only then that they start to pick up that, that treated solution, soil solution, that they start to have the, the, the impact. There's um, atrazine uh, post-emergence on, on cucklebur. So it's treated now on, on day four. You start to see the, the symptoms right there at the point of contact. Um, they have that contact, but then they're starting to move throughout the, the leaf, and the leaf then starts to, to collapse. So we get dis different symptoms and speed of symptoms um, on the soil applied versus the post-emergence when atrazine uh, uh, is, is involved. Both cases, atrazine is stopping photosynthesis um, and, and uh, allowing, the, one, the plant to starve, but also as, that, uh, breaks, as the plant starves and, and cell tissue opens up, we're starting to get uh, some of the acids within those cells spreading and causing that necrosis on the leaf. Some of the, and again, the symptoms we see are the same as whether we're spraying atrazine on corn and trying to uh, control weeds, or if we have atrazine contamination in a tank and it gets sprayed on a vegetable crop. The type of symptoms we see are going to be very similar. Here's a, a bean leaf here in the middle. You can see, oh, where is that mouse when you need it? Anyways, in the middle there. <laughs> There's a bean leaf. There we go. Here we go. There's a bean leaf there. You're starting to see um, lighter uh, green or chlorosis on the margins of the leaf. This is uh, atrazine just starting to have an impact as it, uh, as it develops in the soybeans here at the bottom. You see that, that, that yellowing turning to brown and necrosis, and eventually the whole leaf starts to, to die. The next group is the pigment inhibitors which includes two very different uh, um, chemistries. Both Command and Callisto are examples of the different chemistry we have there. Command, something that we apply to the soil, um, has very little post-emergence activity. Um, it's taken up through the roots, moved throughout the plants, uh, whereas uh, Callisto or Mesotrione can be applied both foliar as well as uh, soil application. Reason they're called bleachers is they inhibit pigment um, production. As a result of lack of pigments, plants turn white, very distinctively white. Um, small grasses, uh, a lot of times it might be very difficult to determine whether it was uh, um, turning white as a result of command versus, versus callisto because the symptoms are very similar. You start looking at it a little bit further, you know, you can separate it out because of maybe what broadleaves might be affected or what crop is applied in the response in the crop. But the initial symptoms on, on some, some uh, 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 similar species that, that uh, be, well, in this case, grasses, it would be very difficult initially to determine whether it's a callisto or um, command. I mentioned uh, Callisto. There's two other uh, um, active ingredients in that group. Besides Callisto, there's, there's Laudus um, or Impact or Armazon. Um, new product for this region, or at least the southern part of this region, and it's also a pigment inhibitor, is the uh, uh, um, Isoxafluto, which is imbalanced flex. As I mentioned, very distinctive whitening. You see whitening here uh, um, on the on the plants, uh, uh, almost snow white. Injury on grasses, turning very white. You can see white here. Uh, it, it, the uh, between the veins, you're getting more whitening. You may even, you know, the the veins themselves are staying darker green. Um, but these are all very distinctive uh, white or bleaching uh, symptoms associated with loss of chlorophyll. The next class that are plant growth regulators. Um, examples here are Clarity or Banville and 2,4-D. 
Uh, most of these are dr um, applied directly to the plant or to the foliage. Uh, most of them have, have foliar activity. We will often see, we, we can see soil activity or soil injury with, with sensitive plants with this chemistry as well. But um, the way most of us are using them are as post-emergent herbicides um, or to control existing vegetation. So we think of them as being uh, uh, post-emergence. The symptoms that we see, what it causes is, is abnormal growth in, in the cells. We get uneven growth which, uh, within the cell tissue, which causes a lot of twisting and bending of plants. Uh, we can get thickened uh, um, stems as, uh, as a result of misapplication or too high of a rate of these products. Um, injury here is often happens pretty quickly. Uh, you hear a lot of people say that using 2,4-D or band will cause plants to grow themselves to death. Some examples, 2,4-D, butyrac or 2,4-DB, stinger, star rain, which we're now starting to use more in some of our small grains, and the triclopyr products. We also often think too of uh, plant growth regulators as being strictly broadleaf or uh, broadleaf being sensitive to, to plant growth regulators. Most of the time grasses are not very sensitive to it. We get rates high enough, we can see some activity on grass, but the, uh, uh, the, the symptoms are usually more pronounced on broadleaf plants. You get a lot of bending and twisting. Um, you can get uh, cupping of, of sensitive leaves like we see down here in the lower left corner. They are fairly fast acting. Let's look at what 2,4-D on tomatoes might look like under uh, time-lapse photography. Day one, it's applied. At the end of day one, we're seeing effect. Day two, even more. And it just continued to wrap around itself and as they say, grow itself to death. By day four there, you were starting to see, if you look close enough, you can see some more thickening of that stem, of that main stem as well. Some more symptoms. Um, bending, curling of, of, of stems, twisting around upon themselves, new growth coming out, very clubbed, um, very strapped. With corn, um, a lot of times we think of the plant growth regulators as causing uh, the, the brace roots of actually fusing together, um, which can impact the uh, stability of the plant uh, late in the season. The uh, amino acid inhibitors. This is a, a, a group of, of herbicides that includes the ALS inhibiting herbicides as well as glyphosate. They stop amino acids. They, while ALS and glyphosate work on different amino acids, they work on amino acids that are specific to plants, which makes them quite safe for, for, for humans. They stop the production of amino acids and essentially the, the um, which needed for protein and eventually the plant starves itself to death. As a result, it's relatively slow acting. Oh, I knew I was gonna do it sooner or later. Dang it. Uh, I hit the end button here. How do I get back? Mm -hmm. any, any quick uh, tips here, Charles? Just go up. Oh, that's a good question. Keep. Uh, there we go, okay. Thank you. So within the ALS inhibiting herbicides, it's a really large group of, of products. The example I'm using here is Classic, uh, used in soybeans. It, it stops, uh, as I mentioned, the amino acid, um, stops protein. Symptoms that we see is as the plant uses up its reserves of, of, of the proteins, we start to get stunting. Um, oftentimes yellowing, sometimes purplish growth in the growing points, and, and eventually death of the plant. As I mentioned, it's a large group. This is not even a complete list, but includes the sulfonylureas listed here on the left, the imidazolinones on the right, 
and the sulfonamides uh, at the bottom. These are all very active at very low amounts, so we're often using these at ounces to the acre. So it doesn't take much to see some activity on these. So as I mentioned, see it on the, on the uh, um, um, newer leaves first. It's uh, translocated to the newer leaves where it's stopping uh, um, the, the, the protein synthesis. Start to see some yellowing. Uh, can get some uh, distorted growth, but it's generally uh, an overall yellowing that we see. Maybe at first glance, it might look at like a nutrient deficiency. But they tend to be slow acting. Here's an example of uh, chlorosulfuron, one of the sulfonylureas applied to the soil, beans coming up through it. So it's planted into treated soil, six or seven days. You start to see that bean come up. Um, soil's treated on the right. Is, um, they're, they're coming up fine. They look normal. But now we're at day 12 and still only have the unifoliate leaves. And they just don't ex expand beyond that. It's usually about 14 days, and that, that time lasts is where we start to see some symptoms in terms of yellowing and, and necrotic tissue. But they'll come up and they'll just sit there for the longest period of time. One of the other things about these ALS products is because they're used at very low rates, we often end up with very, when, when we do have problems with, with injury, it tends to be not very uniform across the field. You'll get a few plants that, that look very healthy, and then you'll start to see some patches where, with, with more severe symptoms. And it's not very uniform across the field, and a lot of that's attributed to the fact that the rates that we're using are so low that uh, some plants are not picking up the, the treated soil. A lot of yellowing, uh, purpling on some of these plants here. Bottom center here, we got some purpling going on on, on this grass. Um, Misapplications in, in soils, sometimes we'll get poor root development as well with these ALS products. Some ALS injury on, on uh, cucurbits, uh, yellowing in the, the younger leaves. The other example within the protein uh, amino acid in, inhibitors is glyphosate. Um, again, stops the uh, production of uh, essential amino acids. These are different amino acids than we have with our ALS chemistry. What it looks like on, uh, um, on horseweed or mare's tail, it's translocated to the growing point. We start to see injury, starts to uh, turn, turn, turn yellow. Relat again, relatively sl slow acting. Here it is. Uh, on, on some, looks like bean plants there. Um, older leaves are, uh, appear to be fine, very dark green, but the newer tissue coming out very light colored. So it's basically starving the, 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 the plant as a result, they're relatively slow acting. The next class are the fatty acid inhibitors. These are the post-emergence grass herbicides like Select, Fusillade, Axial now falls into this group. Um, they are foliar applied, uh, post-emergence, and, and most of these products affect only grasses. It, it uh, stops the, photo, um, the lipid synthesis, um, and so we end up with stunted plants, and that lipid synthesis is most active in the growing point, and as a result, that growing point dies and starts to, to decay pretty quickly. Problem is with grasses, those growing points are not often very visible. They're down where the, the, the nodes are on the grasses. So if you pull those, if you suspect that it might be one of these fatty acid inhibitors, if you pull the, the, uh, the, the leaves apart along the, the, the stems and pull it out at the nodes, you'll see this uh, lipid uh, disintegration right here, very brown, um, starting to decay but that's not really visible until you start to pull out those stems and those leaves. On some plants, uh, you'll often, you, you might get some purpling associated with this, um, that, that, that uh, 
Um, growing point is dead. We're not getting the translocation, the movement of, of uh, nutrients beyond that, uh, that, 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 that injured area. And it probably uh, attributes to why we might see more purpling uh, above the treated zone. These are often very slow acting. The other thing with these is while they may have the effect, you'll see uh, grass plants treated um, with, with post or fusillate remain in the field sometimes four or five weeks after application. You don't see any more growth out of them, you don't see any more green tissue, but they just don't die <laughs> uh, and start to decay like you do see with, with other herbicides. Here's what uh, uh, fusillade on beans and on oats might look like. So they were, whoop, why is that happening? So they're planted together, sprayed. Uh, we're looking at three days after spraying. See these oats are, are still, they haven't grown while the soybeans continue to grow above them, but they, you really aren't seeing much effect yet. And here we are about 14 days after application. Now we're starting to see some browning and starting to see those oats uh, uh, bend over and, and die. But 14 days and really saw very little effect at that point. So they are very slow acting. Uh, contact herbicides, two, two uh, um, groups here, the PPO inhibiting herbicides, which are uh, represented by Reflex for, for one, Cadet is another one, um, and then our nitrogen metabolism, which is a contact herbicide. Um, this is Liberty. Most of these are fairly fast acting, um, see results within a couple of days. Um, but because they're contact, the activity we see is at the site of contact between that herbicide droplet and the plant. We co uh, coverage is important with these products. Both the PPO and the um, um, Liberty product, Lufosinate, require sunlight for maximum effectiveness. So we often see more activity, quicker activity when they're applied say in, in midsummer as, as opposed to maybe using them um, in April or, or March as, as possibly a burn down herbicide. With that full sunlight, we tend to get much faster activity with these products. With the PPO herbicide specifically, um, some of them do have soil activity. Um, um, many of them will have post, uh, post or foliar activity as well. Uh, they can have activity on both broadleaves and grasses, although we think of them primarily as, as broadleaf herbicides. They kill the plant by destroying cell membrane. They kill that membrane, the membrane disintegrates. Again, the acids within that, uh, that cell spill out, damage uh, uh, adjacent cells, and they continue to have a cascading effect across the plant. That's why we tend to see a lot of burning uh, uh, brown necrotic tissue with these products. It includes the uh, diphenyl ethers, blazer, cobra, reflex. Um, the next group, which includes the resource or valor, chateau or cadet, and the triazolinone or aim or spartan authority. The other group within uh, uh, um, cell membrane disruptors, or excuse me, the next group cell, mem uh, or cell membrane disruptors. This is again a contact herbicide. Um, the intercept, uh, interrupt photosynthesis. Paraquat is the example here. Um, one of the faster acting products we have. Again, contact herbicide needs to have good coverage of the plant for, for full activity. Our initial symptoms that we see, usually within a few hours of application, if it's applied under bright sunlight, are water-soaked lesions um, on the plant that then uh, uh, spread out and cascade across the leaf. Here's a paraquat on, on grasses. We kind of see it some of our water-soaked lesions. These uh, then start to turn into brown spots, and they then, again, uh, start to envelop the whole leaf, across the leaf. They tend to be very fast acting, very quick. Uh, the PPO herbicides will also have similar symptoms. It's an example of paraquat on beans. So it's, 
This is a bean plant. It's applied now, day one. By the end of day one, take a look at this uh, meristematic tissue right there at the arrow. We didn't get complete coverage of that, and it's starting to produce new tissue right there in that axial. So again, it illustrates the importance of coverage across the whole plant with some of these contact herbicides. Another contact um, um, with, with, within this broader group, we mentioned uh, glufosinate. Um, it in, it, uh, while it's a contact herbicide, has a lot of the same symptoms. It, uh, its um, mechanism is slightly different. It's a nitrogen metabolism in inhibitor. It causes an increase or accumulation of ammonia, which then causes the browning and, and necrotic tissue on the plant. Uh, relatively fast acting, maybe not quite as quick as, uh, uh, as the paraquat, but relatively quick acting. And again, requires full sunlight for, for, for maximum effectiveness. Here's an uh, initial burn of uh, uh, paraquat on, on mare's tail. Um, with, with more time, the, those treated leaves, uh, we start to see more activity. Again, as one cell dies and spills its uh, toxic acids out, it tends to have a more cas cascading effect on the plant. 